All right, welcome to The Sean Spicer Show. It is Tuesday, and I told you yesterday that we had a lot to break down this week, and we're not disappointing you. I mean, we are five days away from the government shutting down. Saturday night at midnight, it shuts down. Uh, I mentioned this yesterday, it's more than just the normal shutdown. Like, this includes the military and everything else. And I'm going to break it down a lot further, but, like, there is no end in sight. I mean, we are literally moving deck chairs and the Titanic is sinking. That's what I'm talking about right now. Um, also, the debate is tomorrow night, the second Republican debate. They set the debate stage last night. Um, but there's actually another debate coming up. You didn't see that coming, did you? I'm gonna tell you about that other debate in a little bit because it's got one of the candidates on the stage, plus another candidate that you probably didn't think about. Governor Gazim, Gavin Newsom of California. Yep, you heard me right, but I'll tell you about that debate in a second because it's intriguing to say the least. And then I mentioned the Senator Menendez thing yesterday. Uh, he's stuffing all this cash. Well, apparently the only reason that they're targeting him is he's a Latino. Yep. And we're not taking into extent that this was all for emergency preparation. That's right. Like you, I stuffed $480,000 in cash just in case the power goes out. I have batteries, flashlights, and $480,000 in cash. That's what his excuse was. I'm not kidding. I'll talk to you a little bit more because I think the walls are closing in a little on him. Plus, a little bit of good news if you're uh, on the Republican side, Dallas Mayor Eric Johnson, he's switching parties. He basically wrote an op-ed saying, no mas to being a Democrat. I'm going to run I'm going to be voting as a Republican. It's a non-affiliation party down there in Dallas being mayor. But he's switching parties, and he had a lot to say about why, which I think is interesting. He will become not only a big city mayor for the Republican parties, which generally you think about New York and Miami, we don't have a ton, but he's also a person of color. This is not good. This adds some credence to this idea that the Democrats are losing. Plus, uh, the border. Man, this is huge, right? Uh, the imagery is frankly disgusting. Our country is being invaded and our politicians have their head in the sand. Chad Wolf was the former Secretary of Homeland Security. He's going to join us in a minute and talk to us why we should really care about the security implications because, as I mentioned yesterday, this Eagle Pass thing, as disgusting as it is, is just a ruse. The Border Patrol is telling us that, you know what, it's look over here, folks, and then all these guys are sneaking in with their fentanyl and their criminal histories and all that. And this is, this is a real threat to our country. And it's pathetic that leaders on both sides of the aisle don't understand that. So we have a lot to break down. Let's get into it. Okay, so in five days, at midnight on Saturday, the government shuts down. Now, I know a lot of people are like, fine, who cares? Um, I mentioned this yesterday. You have a lot of people, enlisted folks in the military and others, that aren't going to get paid. They only get paid once a month. Um, and so if you've got a car payment or food or something to do with your family that you have to make a payment on, this is a big deal. And the reason I say this is because the House is playing games. Um, there, this is not a serious exercise that they're engaged with. And I'm not trying to slight anyone, but there's no strategy. The Senate sent over a pathetic stopgap measure that the Republicans caved and are on board with. And it's, I, I, like I said, but if you're going to jam them, then jam them. Send them back something, for goodness sakes. And right now they're like, oh, we're going to pass all 12 bills. No, you're not. You don't have time for that. And there's not, there's not agreement on that. I get this. I, I, I cannot believe we're here again. And for all these guys who said, oh, this is, we said we'd stop it. Well, where were you in May and June? This didn't come out of nowhere. You all own calendars, for goodness sake. The budget is from the 1st of October to the 30th of September. Every year. So where were you? I just, there is no clear path right now. None. The, the Speaker McCarthy doesn't have the votes. So he can't pass a short-term deal because they don't want that. And he can't pass these one at a time. So make no mistake, the government is shutting down on Saturday night. When you wake up Sunday and you probably don't care, but it will be an iterative thing. People start to realize no passports, you know, museums and shutdown. Who cares about that? Most people will still get their checks because that's mandatory spending. 
these folks in the military and a lot of contractors said, this is going to be real for them. And I'm all for reducing spending and reducing the size of government. I think it's a huge problem how much debt and deficit we have. But I, I just cannot get over this. I was reading a book the other day and there was a Sun Tzu quote and I'm going to butcher it. But here's the quote. It basically said, tactics without strategy is noise. Tactics without strategy is just noise. And that's what we have. Let's do this. Let's pass this. Let's pass that. What do you want? What's the goal? What do we want to accomplish? I want lower spending. I want the government to be smaller and more accountable and more efficient. I want this money that we're sending overseas to be accountable. It's it literally, it's a joke. And no one's talking about it. It's either fund it or don't fund it. What about the money that we spent? Where is it going? We're missing in this conversation. We have people flowing over the border, and we're going to talk to Chad Wolf in a minute. Stay tuned for this. This is unbelievable. This is security. People with records, sexual assault, terrorism, criminals coming in, bringing fentanyl, and we're talking about Taylor Swift going to a football game. Now, I'm as, I think that's cute, too. It's a nice American love story. Yay. But what, what is going on that we could literally let watch this happen and everyone's sitting around like, do, 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 do. Jam them, folks. The guys in the House get together and go, hey, this is the one thing that the Democrats have to agree on. We can make a mockery of the fact that they don't care about this country and who's coming in. Jam them. That's a strategy. I just... I, I am apoplectic that this is what's happening. I mean, all these guys who are now going, no, no, no. Then tell me what the answer is, because right now you've got a golden goose. It's sitting right there. People are flowing over the border. Make that your issue. Jam the Senate. Make them vote down on it. You really think that people are going to do that if you do it right? They, for a little while, they were going down to the Senate, they, I mean, to the border, and they actually got some media attention. Get your act together. Speaking of getting your act together, Senator Menendez, uh, he was out yesterday in a press conference trying to defend this deal that he took $480,000 in cash, gold bars that had the fingerprint of an Egyptian on it that apparently he was bribing and a Mercedes Benz. So in his defense, and this is what, just sit back because it makes total sense now. He was just getting ready for an emergency. So I thought to myself, this, okay, finally, this makes sense to me. I get it now. You are getting ready for an emergency. My wife said the same thing to me last night. She's like, are we ready? Do we have a flashlight? Do we have batteries? Do we have $480,000 in cash? And I was like, battery check, flashlight check, a little short on the $480,000. And he said that the only reason people are going after him is because he's a Latino. He's a Cuban immigrant. And they were very worried about confiscation back then. So he's been taking money out and putting it in. Isn't it more concerning the United States senator has a half a million dollars in cash in his house in a jacket stuffed in the pockets with his name on it? I mean, it's one thing if he had it in some kind of bunker that was safe and he like could make some, you know, with a bunch of food and he was this is a guy who's stuffing it in a jacket. That's not exactly looking to me like you're preparing for uh for the apocalypse there, buddy. I mean, seriously. And the thing that's so interesting is that as I mentioned yesterday, he was indicted but eight, nine years ago, and got off on a hung jury. And that time, he made it clear. This was like New Jersey style. He's like, if you're not with me, I'm going to come after you. And he's, this is no kidding. But the walls are starting to creep in. The governor of New Jersey, Phil Murphy, he said he needs to resign. Another congressman from New Jersey, Andy Kim, he said he's going to primary him. But then his colleagues, Tammy Baldwin, Montana's John Tester, Pennsylvania's Bob Casey, Peter Welsh from Vermont, Sherrod Brown of Ohio on the banking committee where he used to be, all said in Fetterman that he needed to resign. Drip, drip, drip. Now, of course, Chuck Schumer can't be found. The White House, they got nothing to say. You know, they're going to let the judiciary. It's amazing. You know, they have nothing to say. It's amazing, though, how many of these guys. I think on both sides that the last time he had this wall, no one, no one, you know, broke through it because he was like, very clear, I'm coming after you if you come after me, if you don't stand in solidarity with me. This time, I think people with a brain are saying, I'm not defending a guy who had gold bars with the fingerprint of the guy that he was allegedly bribing. And he can't explain it. He didn't mention that at all yesterday, did he? Anyway, it'll be interesting because they all come back now. So there's no excuse. I was at the, when I was at the RNC, I used to joke with people that if like little Timmy at Walter Johnson High School got like into a fight, they'd call the RNC and be like, his dad's a Republican. What's the RNC's comment? 
I'm not kidding. I would uh, honestly, uh, any Republican of any stature that got elected or that did something, I'd get a call. What's the RNC's comment? Chuck Schumer hasn't even commented on this. He's the Democratic majority leader from New York right there next to him. On a million reasons, you should be asking this guy. I mean, it's amazing what they get away with, isn't it? They literally get a guy with gold bricks and all this cash and Chuck Schumer's like, <laughs> maybe today when they're back in town, the people who like to call themselves reporters could ask one of those questions. They talk about being part of journalism. Um, in other political news, the debate stage tomorrow night, Simi Valley, California, they're going to have seven on the stage. Ron DeSantis made it, Vivek Ramaswamy, number two, Nikki Haley was third, Pence, Christie, and Tim Scott, and North Dakota Governor Doug Burgum, he all made it. Asa Hutchinson, nope, he's the guy that didn't make it. So out with Doug Burgum, and out with Asa Hutchinson, I have a hard time believing Doug Burgum is going to make the the, uh, the next one. But then again, the guy's got a ton of cash, and he keeps advertising. I was out in Iowa um, and he was running tons of ads on there. He was running ads this weekend. I mean, he's trying to do what he can. And if you've got that much money, you might as well. But I mentioned um, a moment ago this other debate. So Fox News announced a red versus blue state debate between Governor Ron DeSantis of Florida and California Governor Gavin Newsom. It's going to be November 30th, 9 o'clock in Georgia. Um, and Sean Hannity's the moderator. I got to give Newsom the credit here. I mean, you're walking into the lion's den. And he agreed to it. I think this is the this is Ron DeSantis doing anything to show that he can take him on. But I, the question is, is it going to be too late? November 30th, we're going to have had one more Republican debate by then. And I don't know that DeSantis, if he doesn't have a strong showing tomorrow night, it show that he's a fighter and makes some headway or whatever. I don't know that by the time George, November 30th rolls around, that people are going to care that he's taking on. They might have to like tap in somebody else and be like, hey, uh, you're no longer the guy. Nikki Haley, Mike Pence, whatever, you guys come in. But I think they thought this was going to be helpful to them because they'll have, they'll have had, like, they'll be out there, the strong number two, and then he'll take on DeSantis and show that he can debate and then he'll make some Trump comment. But listen, this is going to be interesting to see if he holds on to November 30th because by then Newsom might say, I don't even want to debate this guy anymore. All right, I want to uh, tell you in a minute about the, we're going to have a great discussion with Chad Wolf about border security, what's happening down there. But I want to tell you before that about the wellness company. It was formed by a team of doctors, including uh, Peter McCullough, who I think you guys may have seen when I had him on Newsmax. He's been a lot on conservative media going out there talking about the, um, the alternative treatments that the government didn't want to talk about during the pandemic, during COVID, right? So things like hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin, um, he founded um, a team of doctors that created the wellness company that's committed to helping you take control of your health, which is why I want to tell you about what they uh, developed. It's this supplement called Spike Support Formula, which was designed out of necessity to find a combination of ingredients that would help block and dissolve something called the COVID spike protein, which is in the bloodstream. And if you've had a bad bout of COVID, you know, where you feel sluggish and tired, little lack of mental clarity, um, this is something that you can do for yourself right now because you will be joining thousands of people who've had all of these issues from COVID. Um, and by taking the spike, spike support daily to combat the, the proteins, you get back to that pre-COVID feeling. So go to twc.health slash Spicer, use code Spicer, get 15% off at the checkout. So go to twc.health. So not .com or anything like that, .health slash Spicer, code Spicer for 15% off. All right, um, some good news in the world of politics that I want to tell you about. Dallas Mayor Eric Johnson left the Democratic Party um, and he's going to become a Republican. Now, um, in Dallas, it's a nonpartisan office. Uh, so you don't run as a Republican and Democrat, but every, obviously based on your Voter registration people know what you are. And he wrote this op-ed in the Wall Street Journal that said, I'm leaving the Democratic Party. I'm going to join the Republican Party and be voting in the next uh, Republican primary to, to support a Republican. Um, anyway, and you think about it, this is, Republicans generally don't um, control big cities. You think of Dallas and um, LA, New York, right? All those, Chicago, 
Democrats. This move is going to make Dallas the most populous city in the country to have a Republican mayor. Um, and I think that's a big deal. It's a good deal. Uh, he's also a person of color. So it's another big win for the party, but also a big loss for the Democrats. This is what he wrote. He wrote, the future of, the, of America's great urban centers depends on the willingness of the nation's mayors to champion law and order and practice fiscal conservatism. Our cities desperately need the genuine commitment to these principles, as opposed to the inconsistent poll-driven commitment of many Democrats that has long been defining uh, a defining characteristic of the GOP. In other words, American cities need Republicans, and Republicans need American cities. I, I think this is huge, and I hope that it's the beginning of something where these mayors are saying these policies don't work. Nick Friedrich yesterday was joking about Chicago. I mean, you look at the stores that are moving out, you know, these big box chains and retailers that say, I can't be there anymore for a variety of reasons, but largely crime. I know I drive into the city here in DC. It's just not the same. I mean, it has gotten worse and worse and worse. You don't feel safe anymore. And then they're doing stupid things to drive businesses out. And I think the mayor is saying, hey, I get it. I can't be part of this. I have to run a city that I want metrics to show that we're getting better. And virtue signaling about progressive causes isn't going to help you. So uh, that's a great piece of positive news. I wish it actually had gotten more attention uh, because for a variety of reasons, it's a huge win for the Republican Party, but a huge loss for the Democrats. And of course, you know, it, the, if he hadn't written this op-ed, I don't know that it would have gotten any attention. It wasn't like it was covered, right? You've got a person of color leading a major city. That would normally be a, a big story on the Today Show, on the evening news, but nothing, nothing. I mean, think about it, the only coverage he got was he literally wrote his own op-ed. I mean, it was like a press release from him that the Wall Street Journal carried. But I'll still take it. And it's important to know. By the way, the mayor of Fort Worth is also a Republican, meaning that whole area that's seeing this tremendous amount of growth realizes that these Republican policies are what, what works for the people down there. Um, I mentioned a minute ago that debate in Simi Valley. And obviously, you know, you heard and noticed that Trump isn't there again. Um, because in this time, the first one he did, Tucker Carlson, and got huge ratings. This time he's going to Michigan to talk to a bunch of union workers, right? Because this issue is really about this administration jamming electric cars down their throat, which means less workers, more automation, more parts from outside the country, more parts made from non-union workers. So the policies of this administration, the Biden administration, are what's in large part driving it. And Trump smartly is like, great, I can pick these guys off. I can talk about my support for combustion engines and, um, and gas-powered vehicles. I can make this huge contrast. And he's already probably, he, he got the most union votes of anyone since Reagan. So what does Biden do? Biden, who hasn't been to East Palestine in Ohio because he hasn't, he has a busy schedule. What was he asked about the other day? And Corinne Jean-Pierre said, oh, his schedule is really busy. Suddenly it's time to go hit the picket line. So all these guys in the media are like, this is the first time we've ever seen a president do that. He's going to go there on Tuesday, today. It's the first time a sitting president has ever visited a picket line. Oh, <gasps> you know what? That means he's in trouble in Michigan. I mean, Trump won by 10,700 votes in 2016. Biden won by 2% in 2020. You not think this is a problem? Hello? This isn't about that. I mean, what's he going to do? He's going to go there and say, I stand in solidarity with you. My policies are making you guys do this. I, I mean, this is actually kind of brazen, right? He's the guy causing the problem. And then he wants to go stand in solidarity with the guy that he's hurt, with the people that he's hurting. It's, and, and by the way, again, I don't mean to just continue to tee off on the press, but hey, why not? You think about it. These guys are like, it's the first time he's going in history. What about the problem that he's causing it? At some point, do your job. All right. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about liver health because so many of us are, well, at least I can speak for myself, are working out, trying to eat better, taking care of ourselves. But the latest data from the American Heart Association indicates that Many adults, we're talking like 100 million of us, have what's called a fatty liver. And I think that sounds pretty gross. 
Um, but adults with fatty liver were three times, three and a half times actually more likely to have heart failure than those without. So you need to care about this because I think for a lot of us, it's something that we don't talk about, we don't ask about, um, but we might have. And the liver does a ton for us. Um, it gets a, like, I don't know, there's 500 key things that it does every day, but we're throwing everything at it. I mean, it's literally like the little engine that could every day, handling cholesterol, alcohol, toxins, statins, air pollution. So a lot of us deal with weight gain or lose energy because of that. There's something that we can do though. Liver health formula. It's an all natural supplement, which contains 12 clinically proven botanicals that help recharge and protect our liver. It's manufactured here in the US. Two million bottles have already been sold. And I've got a great offer for you. You can try liver health formula and get a bottle of omega-3s to help your heart. Uh, so go to get liver help slash Spicer and claim your free bonus gift when you do that. Get liver health help, help. I said health. It should be healthy. But get liverhelp.com slash Spicer and you'll get that free bottle of omega-3s. All right, you guys know the, the situation at the border has gotten so bad, even the mainstream media, the legacy left-wing mainstream media has to cover it. It's not just the people coming in, though. That would be bad enough in terms of law and order. But it's what else is coming in. The drugs, the terrorism, the sexual predators, the former criminals. They're all coming in. So I'm excited to have a conversation to talk about what this really means for our national security, the impact it can have on our families and our communities with Chad Wolf. Chad was the former acting Homeland Security under President Trump. He's the co-host of the America First Policy Institute's Thank, uh, The Tank podcast. He's the founder of Wolf Global Advisors and the executive director of America First Policy Institute um, that is doing such great work, making sure that the next Republican president has the tools, the policies, the people in place when they take office. So without further ado, Chad Wolf. Chad, thanks for joining us today. I appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me. So I think part of the problem that concerns me about the border is I watch these folks come in. I hear the stories from the border patrol and the border chief about the concerns that we should have. But I then look at stuff like what CBS News is putting out and they're calling people entering the country illegally quote, coming in without authorization. Um, and I think part of the problem is, is that, do you think that we are doing a disservice to the nation in how we're presenting the, the threat that we face at our southern border? Yeah, I think that's right. Look, it's, it's part, it's an attempt by this administration to somehow downplay what's going on along that border, right? It's no longer illegal activity. It's no longer illegal aliens. And again, Alien is a defined term in immigration law. It's actually what Congress passed, uh, calling these individuals aliens because uh, they are not U.S. citizens. And so when they cross illegal, guess what? You become an illegal alien. Um, and that's defined, again, in immigration law. And so what the Biden administration wants you to believe is none of that matters. Instead, we call them undocumented. Well, they're not undocumented. They're here illegally. A lot of them actually have documents. They're just not from this country. So this whole idea of, of trying to downplay what's going on along that border and trying to ignore U.S. law in the process is really quite um, surprising. Um, and I think, they, you know, they've been at this now for 28 months, and I think they think it's working and that, you know, we've got some of the legacy media picking up on this and using the same terminology as they are. In fact, it's funny, Ralph Northam, Norman, uh, was on CNN with Jim Acosta. And let me, let me kind of tell you, so he says, our... our uh, you know, he basically says, have you been to the border? Acosta says, yes, I have. Um, have you seen what's going on north of Massim? And, and Acosta says, I'll ask the questions. The border is not open. That's something that is peddled as a talking point, but it's not true. There are fences, there are walls, there are border agents. That's Jim Acosta lecturing Congressman Ralph Norman. Do you think that the border is open? Well, those are, well, obviously the answer to that is yes. And, and Jim Acosta has the same talking points that Secretary Mayorkas has over at the Department of Homeland Security. And it doesn't really matter. I mean, his response to that is juvenile. Have you been to the border? Of course I have. Have you seen what's going on? The rapes? The, uh, it's, it's open. I mean, nobody can, can deny that. The border is and uh, they've got a, it's a crisis. Where? I'll ask the question, sir. And, and the border is, is not open. That is... That is something that, that is uh, peddled as a talking point, but it's not true. 
There are, there are fences, there are walls. Uh, there are Border Patrol agents who, yeah. who work okay. on the border. The five plus million uh, that have gotten into this country illegally uh, is not a figment of, of our imagination. Ask the Border Patrol agents. Ask anybody yeah. down there. They're frustrated. But I guess I haven't, you, you have uh, not no, been able to answer my question as to how you effectively do border enforcement if you're shutting down the government. I guess, but I guess we're not going to well, get an answer to that question. It's juvenile in the sense to say, well, there's walls and there's fences and there's border patrol agents, so therefore it's not open. The problem is you can have all the walls that you want. You can have all the border patrol agents, but if you ignore the law and you don't enforce the law and you release people into the interior of the country at will, none of it matters. People are going to scale walls. They're going to climb over fences. Border patrols are going to encounter thousands of folks as they are doing today. But this idea that you're just going to release them negates all of that enforcement activity that you have along that border, which is exactly has been the case for the last 28 months. So I kind of laugh, you know, hearing Jim Acosta say that or hearing anyone on the left say that, because what that tells me is they don't understand the border. They've never been, or they've maybe been once. And so therefore they're a border expert. Um, and they truly don't understand what's happening along that border. And the fact that you can have all the walls and all the fences that you want, but if you leave gates open and you allow individuals to come in and you don't remove them, None of it matters. Well, I mean, that's the thing that I think is funny is that Acosta saying, you know, that's something that's peddled as a talking point. There are fences, there are walls. I can see with my own eyes what's happening at Eagle Pass. I don't need, to, I mean, you can have, to your point, there can be a wall, there can be 10 fences. People are lifting up the wire, they're going under it, they're coming yeah. through the river. That I, I don't think that regardless of whether there is a wall, the question is, are they coming in and are they being stopped? And I think unequivocally, the answer to that is no. Oh, well, absolutely. The answer is no. And we, look, we can talk about Remain in Mexico. We can talk about a variety of different programs and policies. There's only one thing that matters, which is as those illegal aliens are coming into the United States, are they being released? And in this case, there are mass releases going on every single day because they are out of shelter space. And so what those individuals are doing is they get to where they want to go, whether it's New York City or Chicago or wherever else, they're calling back home and say, hey, made it across the border, was released in under 24 hours, you too can come. And that's why we continue to see these record numbers. And so again, it doesn't matter what kind of infrastructure, the Constantino wire doesn't have, you know, if you don't actually enforce the law, which the federal government is not doing, they are choosing to look the other way. Um, this, is, this is what happens. And then on top of all of this, uh, to designate Venezuelans and give them temporary protective status, TPS, which is a term of art in immigration law, You've basically said about 500,000 uh, Venezuelans now get to reside here in the country. They get a work permit. They can't be uh, deported. You're just you're 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 sending a signal to every other Venezuelan in the world. Get here to the United States because you, too, will get the same status at some point under the Biden administration. You know, a lot of Republicans um, make fun of and point out that President Biden has never been to the border. As someone who led this effort, how important is it that he actually see it? Well, it's critically important, uh, but it's not just seeing it, right. although that, that's a start. Uh, it's actually talking to Border Patrol uh, agents and experts down there, listening to them, asking them hard questions, trying to understand what are the problems facing them, because the, these are not shy individuals. They will tell you exactly what is going on down there, and they will tell you exactly what they need. And I think that's why he hasn't visited. He, he's not, he, A, he would not get a, a warm reception, but B, he would hear a variety of things that he doesn't want to hear because they have no solutions. Right. When the Border Patrol agents say, I need more physical infrastructure so that I can redeploy my assets better, he's going to have to turn, he's going to have to look at him and say, well, I stopped all that. I'm not, I'm not doing that any longer. That was yeah. a political promise I made during the campaign. So it doesn't matter if it's effective for you or not. I'm not doing it. Like these, these are the conversations that he would have to have, which is I know exactly why he's not going. Yeah, it's funny because I think part of it is seeing it. Once you realize that you can't use the Jim Acosta talking point, that you watch these people come over. And it's funny because I know you're probably familiar with this book. It's Moving Forward. It's Corinne Jean-Pierre's book. Um, but in it, she writes... I needed to go to the border and see what it was like for these children. I needed to bear witness to this injustice. She's talking about why she needed to go to the border because she needed to see it firsthand. And yet the president of the United States 
I think to your point, won't go there because once you see it, you can't unsee it. You can't say, I didn't recognize the reality of what's happening at the border. Well, I'm not, I'm not familiar with her book, so thanks for bringing that up. I'm not sure the context I'll get of the it. time it's, frame. Is. I'm liking this down. Chad Wolf, Christmas, <laughs> Moving Forward by Corinne right. Jean-Pierre. You know, they, you know, I, again, when I was in service at, at DHS, I, I got a lot of incoming from the left about uh, the number of individuals dying in Border Patrol custody, um, which in a six-month span at one point during my tenure, we had four deaths. Today, there's about two deaths per day going on along that border because of what's occurring in that river and the amount of individuals coming across that border. So hopefully they're just as outraged as they were during the Trump administration as they are during the Biden administration. I'm not holding my breath on that front. So I think what this has really said is a lot of the left's outrage. And so whether it's the White House spokesperson or, or you know, different congresswomen and, and men, it, it's all selective outrage at the end of the day. And so it's, it's very political in nature. But I do agree with you, Sean. I think to go there, to experience, to smell it, to understand what, what life is like on that border, it's very hard to then come back to D.C. and say, uh, you know what, I'm, I'm going to ignore what I, uh, what I saw. You can't do that. But at the same time, one visit, even two visits, even a handful of visits really doesn't get you what you need unless you talk with the agents down there. You ride along, you do a ride along from midnight to 3 a.m. and you, you see what they encounter and then you see the impact of your policies have on what they do every day. If you're an animal lover like me, uh, and I've told you guys before, I've rescued three dogs. We have a beautiful black lab right now. Then I wanna make sure you know about the great work that Delta Rescue is doing. Um, Delta Rescue are the folks that go out there and make sure that abandoned animals left just in the wilderness, dogs, cats, horses, you name it, that they don't care. They take care of these abandoned animals. Um, they are the largest care for life animal sanctuary in the entire world. And the beautiful part about it is they are a no-kill shelter. They literally make sure that anything that comes across their bow, dog, cat, whatever that comes in, uh, gets the care that they need, the veterinarian care, the nutrition, a place to play and be loved. Um, and it's so heartwarming knowing that they're not up against a clock, right? Which so many shelters, just because of capacity and funding, don't have the ability to do that. Delta Rescue does that, but they need our help. They rely totally and solely on contributions from people like me and you. If you can go help them, no contribution is too small. Every dollar helps five, 10, 20, 100, Heck, $1,000. Uh, if you go to deltarescue.org, they can answer your questions. You'll get an amazing newsletter that will tell you about all the work that they're doing. Um, and you get to see it right there firsthand. So please go to deltarescue.org, deltarescue.org, and help support the amazing work that these guys are doing. I was listening to the to the new border chief in some interviews that he gave, and, and his whole point was Eagle Pass is where all these folks are coming in. It's almost like a shiny nickel that Border Patrol surges the resources to Eagle Pass to deal with this influx. But then the cartels go, great, we'll go 100 miles down the way and we'll bring in fentanyl, we'll bring in drug traffickers, we'll bring in uh, people convicted of you know, yeah. sexual assault or sexual molestation or human trafficking or other criminals. From a DHS standpoint, from a national security standpoint, how concerned should we be about that? Well, I think very concerned, particularly in the numbers that we see today. Look, this is a common uh, tactic used by cartels and smugglers, which is to say you distract Border Patrol and you distract them either with a large group of individuals crossing the border or you send three or four individuals under the cover of night um, you know, into an area that's patrolled by CBP. You let them get caught. So basically you're sacrificing them so that Border Patrol then pulls all their resources to that area and then 20 miles down, or you could even just go five miles down the border, you are smuggling and trafficking more and more stuff, individuals and, and goods across that border. So this is a very common tactic. Border Patrol is very much aware of it. The problem though, Sean, today is the fact that the vast majority, I would say 70 to 80% of Border Patrol assets are in Border Patrol facilities processing migrants which is exactly where they should not be. We need 80 to 90 to 100% of them on the line so that they, they're plugging holes and so you can't have this tactic that the cartels use. But when you only have 10 to 15% of Border Patrol agents on the line, 
And so when they swarm an activity, such as an illegal border crossing, it leaves miles and miles and miles of the border wide open. The Biden administration knows this. They don't care. If they cared, they would do something different and they would change tactics. So if Republicans right now asked you, how do we properly message what's happening at the border? Yeah. What is your advice? Well, I would say uh, three things. One, you've got to secure the border. You've got to end the human trafficking that's going on. And then we've got to get serious about the cartels, the Mexican cartels. I think most Americans would get behind all three of those and to differing degrees, of course. But I think most Americans, 80 to 90 percent of Americans say, yes, I need to secure the border better than it is today. Yes, we need to stop the human trafficking that's going on down there. And yes, the cartels are a problem. And so there's solution sets to all three of those. Um, again, the Biden administration is not interested actually in, in looking at that. And in fact, President Biden's taken off the table some very dramatic action that we could do against the cartels and has basically told President AMLO that he's, he is not going to take any type of decisive action. And so in turn, the president of Mexico is not really taking any action for us and not doing their job uh, to help stem this crisis either. So you've got some candidates running for president on the Republican side that are talking about literally going in um, yep. and treating the cartels either as a terrorist organization or declaring war on them. What would, I mean, is that, is that a feasible option that you would support if you were DHS secretary and had to advise the president? Yeah, what I would say is all options need to be on the table. We have now, uh, the cartels are, should be public enemy number one, killing more Americans than anything else going on in the world today. Um, and we need to stop uh, admiring the problem, which we have now done for decades and just kind of saying, well, it is what it is. We actually need to get serious about this. So um, I would look at, you know, you can designate them a terrorist organizations. You can look at the use of military force. I would have hard conversations with the governor of Mexico and say, I'm about to exercise all of these options because I cannot sit by and let Americans die day after day after day unless you want to do something dramatic on your side to help, help me stop this crisis. So I would always use these as leverage points. Um, and again, President Biden's taken all of this off the table, so he has no leverage, uh, which is why we see gov Mexico, the government of Mexico and the president of Mexico not doing much to help out at the end of the day. So they, they've come about this all wrong. Uh, but there are a number of things that you can do as you target the cartels. I, I just think that I, I feel like, to your point about the, the messages, that Republicans are being too timid. I mean, there are people coming into our country that are bringing in drugs um, that we know of. This isn't like rhetoric. This is straight out of the border chief's mouth that are coming in that have a criminal record, have trafficked children, yeah. have trafficked women. And I'm thinking to myself, I just can't believe there's not greater outrage. And I, I remember, I know the one thing the Republicans did well from a messaging standpoint is they brought groups down to the border and the media was forced to cover it. Yeah. And I feel like it worked for a month and then they kind of faded away. I, I just, I, 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 I think that there's a degree to which Republicans need to step up and say, here's, here's what is happening in your community in terms of fentanyl, child trafficking. Um, potential criminals entering it. I just don't, I don't get the sense. I joked about this yesterday and I, I actually, I shouldn't say I joked. I pointed out the fact that the Today Show is leading with Taylor Swift attending a football game, which is cute. And I get that. Yeah. But the reality is that our nation is under attack. Our community is under attack. Eric Adams, the mayor of New York is saying it. And yet we, there's almost a collective yawn. Yeah. Well, so I don't disagree with any of that, Sean. I think, uh, in some instances, I, I think maybe the American people, and I would include congressmen and, and policymakers, have a little bit of border fatigue, yeah. right? So this has been going on now for 28 months. And it's like every, every month, other than a few months here and there, is worse than the previous month. And so you kind of get numb to it. And you're just like, well, it's out of control. And I don't think anything's going to change. I think that's actually the wrong approach. Um, I've been very vocal. We need new leadership at the Department of Homeland Security. Um, I think the steps that the secretary has taken, um, uh, numerous of them are unlawful. Um, and so there was a big push three or four months ago about really doing something about leadership at the department. I think that's on the back burner now as you look at some of the you know, impeachment inquiries into President Biden, um, which is to say there's multiple things going on in the country all at the same time. 
And from my perspective, I would love the border and the border crisis and, and the impact it's having on American communities to be front and center every day. It's just there, you know, there's a lot of things going on that are, that are taking people's time and attention. But I do think that that border fatigue kind of syndrome, I think, is at play here. Yeah, I agree. It's amazing how it went from impeach Mayorkas to, you know, let's get Biden. And I get it. I mean, there's some, you can yeah. only do so many things. Um, let me ask you about a shutdown. I think there's no question it's inevitable Saturday night at midnight that we enter shutdown. How does that affect DHS writ large, not just at the border, but overall in terms of our nation's security? Yeah, so many of the uh, many of the positions, particularly those along the border, Border Patrol and some of our customs officers down along the border, uh, they're going to be exempt, Sean. They're, they're, they have national security positions. And so a good portion of the department, though not all of it, is exempt during a government shutdown. So the impact on DHS from a frontline uh, activity is, I wouldn't say it's minimal, uh, but it's minimal to the American public. Now, a lot of the back office stuff is shut down. Um, not everyone at headquarters in, in D.C. and el elsewhere are national security positions. So there will be some impact, but it, it's not going to be, it's not like Border Patrol officers won't show up the next day, particularly along the southern border that we're dealing with now, or customs officials won't show up the next day to, to let some of that uh, legitimate trade and travel occur along the border. They, they will still show up, uh, but as the longer the impact goes on, kind of the support functions behind them will obviously be shut down. But what I mean, but it's got to impact morale, right? If you know that you you might get paid in two weeks, but you're not going to get paid now, you're a little bummed. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're, this is well. This is I I think that's right. Look, a lot of these border patrol agents, the new ones will certainly be like, "Well, what's going on?" Folks that have been through this time and time again, they kind of understand it, All right? Uh, because the little known secret about a government shutdown is you get back pay, right? right? So you're getting paid. It's just it's not coming right away. And so if it's one paycheck or two paychecks that starts to hurt. If it's beyond that, it really, really starts yeah. to hurt a lot of these agents. Um, so we'll just have to see how long it goes. Uh, before we go, I just want to, I want to switch gears for a second. I, from a national security and homeland security perspective, how concerned, where do you put China in the current yeah. state of our relationships uh, with, with our security? I, I just, I feel like when President Biden got asked the other day, when the last time he talked to Xi Jinping, he was like, well, I talked to the traveling secretary uh, I mean, like he, it was like a George Costanza moment. He's like, well, I talked to this deputy who said that he was going to give him a message. I think that's pretty scary. A hundred percent. It's scary. Look, when I, uh, I released uh, during my last year at, at the Department of Homeland Security in 2020, a threat assessment that outlined the threats to the homeland as I saw them, given the intelligence that I was seeing. And I put China at the top of that list uh, for a variety of different reasons that we I'm happy to go into. But we need to keep our eye on the, on the larger threat here. And while the border is absolutely a national security threat today, impacting and killing Americans today, uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that that will be solved. But the Chinese threat, uh, particularly from the Communist Party there in China, will be long lasting. And they attack us and they infiltrate us a variety of different ways. And so as I look at the security of the homeland, our economic security, right? What makes America great? is our economic security and continues to lead the world in a variety of different ways. That is under attack mainly from the Communist Party of China. But as, as an everyday American, are there things that we should be worried about right now, like in terms of the apps that we use, the, the way that we live our life? Well, I think so. Uh, Technology is a great, a great example of that. But uh, the Chinese are also buying ag land, buying land against uh, near major military installations all across this country. That should impact you, particularly if you live in those uh, communities. Uh, they're using our visa system. Uh, the number of students over here that are Communist Party members stealing intellectual property, stealing uh, trade secrets and the like. All of this is happening kind of under the, under the surface. Um, so a lot of Americans don't see this, maybe don't interact with it every single day. But guess what? It is going on across this country every single day. And, and what I would say is, United States, we've, we've got to do better playing that long game. Uh, we usually will tackle the immediate crisis right before our eyes, like kind of that five meter target. We need to be looking 50 meters out and what's, what are the threats and what are the challenges that we're going to have in four to five to six years. And all of these from the Communist Party of China, um, are, we're going to have to deal with here. Okay. 
Chad Wolf, uh, I appreciate your time uh, and your perspective because right now with these challenges that we face both at the border in terms of China, there's no one better to have the perspective than you. Thank you for the work that you're doing over at America First Policy Institute. And uh, obviously, I hope everyone tunes into the Tank podcast that you host over there as well. Uh, Appreciate that. Thanks, Sean. Thanks for having me. All right. Take care. All right. Thanks, Chad, for that great discussion. Uh, Wow. Uh, A lot of scary stuff going on both at the border in terms of China. But that's why I like bringing you guys these conversations, because we need to know what's happening. And we also need to know what's not being done to protect us. And that's probably... The most important part of this, we cannot turn a blind eye to what's happening both at our southern border and the threat that we face from China. Um, uh, it's, it worries me. And I hope that it doesn't meant to scare you, but it's meant to make sure that we're holding our leaders accountable. They're focused on the right things. Being safe and secure and protecting against the threats that we face in the future is obviously, you, you can't have anything else. You can't be woke and tell your liberal friends, you don't worry about your pronouns if you're under attack, right? We don't have safety and security. We don't have a country and there's nothing to worry about. Um, tomorrow is debate day. I talked to you about that. There's a lot to cover and to break down and how much this debate matters. Will it move the needle? Who needs to do well? Uh, if you're a political junkie, tune in. Mark Halpern's going to join us on the show. Uh, he's obviously been around a long, long time. He's one of the best source journalists uh, that I've ever come across. And I've been doing this a long time. Uh, we will also do what we call debate prep. If you remember, we did this before the Milwaukee debate tomorrow morning and Thursday morning. If you want to be part of it, go to my uh, YouTube page, uh, my locals page, seanspicer.locals.com, seanspicer.locals. We can tell you how to get to the thing. Or we'll also be streaming it on the YouTube page live, 9 a.m. Eastern, both tomorrow and Wednesday. And then obviously we'll be back with the show. But Mark will be joining us on the show. He knows the ins and outs of everything that's happening. We're looking forward to a great conversation uh, but that gives you a lot of content for the day. I mean, you should almost call in sick. Well, don't do that. Anyway, thanks for joining us today. Please continue to subscribe and share. If you go to Apple Podcasts, make sure you uh, not only subscribe, but give us a five-star review. I'm loving the five stars. I might even read a few out at some point, but thank you for doing that. And YouTube as well. Appreciate all your support. We'll see you right back here tomorrow on The Sean Spicer Show. Well, if you enjoyed this content, make sure to like this video, subscribe, and click the notification bell to get more.